The war in Ukraine, thousands of lives already lost, towns and cities under siege, some destroyed. More than two million people have fled Ukraine and as sanctions bite, the impact begins reverberating around the globe with the cost of living set to rise sharply both here and abroad. Good morning. As Europe is faced with its biggest refugee crisis since World War II, I've been to Poland, where most Ukrainians have fled, to speak to Poland's President Duda about what Vladimir Putin might do next. But as we say in Poland, using a little bit of an English expression, if he uses any weapons of mass destruction, then this will be a game changer in the whole thing. Ireland's Prime Minister Michal Martin will be here as his country opens its doors to refugees. The minister responsible for bringing refugees to British homes, Michael Gove, will join me to talk about that and the rising cost of living. And after Michael Palin spoke to us last week about his travels through Ukraine and his friendship with a Ukrainian he met there, I managed to find Vadim, still living near Kyiv, and reunite them both after 15 years. Hi, Vadim. Gosh, I feel very emotional. I really do feel very emotional. Mm. And reviewing the papers this morning, I'm joined by the editor of The Mirror, Alison Phillips, and by the deputy political editor of The Daily Telegraph, Lucy Fisher. But first, the news with Victoria Derbyshire. Good morning. Ukrainian officials say up to 30 Russian rockets were fired at a military training base at Yavoriv, which is near the border of NATO member Poland. Russia launched the airstrike at the site close to Lviv, which is the main transport hub for many Ukrainians trying to flee the country. Meanwhile, Russian forces have advanced towards several Ukrainian cities, with more intense fighting reported just north of the capital, Kyiv. Troops are thought to be around 15 miles outside the city, and British military intelligence sources have suggested that fighting may be about to intensify in the capital itself. People here who open their homes to Ukrainian refugees with no ties to the UK will be offered £350 a month. The government scheme being launched tomorrow will require sponsors to host individuals or families for at least six months. And in Rugby Island have the chance to win the Six Nations title after a thrilling victory at Twickenham. They beat 14-man England and could be crowned champions next weekend. That's all from me. The next news on BBC One is at one. Back to you, Sophie. Victoria, thank you. Let's have a look at the front pages. Uh, first of all, we can start with the Sunday Times. Putin wipes out an entire city. Their headline this is President Zelensky accusing the Kremlin of w waging a war of annihilation as the governor of this, uh, this city, Volnovaka, says it no longer exists. The Sunday Telegraph main story there, the, uh, the scheme that the government's launching tomorrow, £350 to host refugees in your home as Britain opens its doors. The Mirror, 100,000 forgotten Ukraine orphans. And the Sunday Mirror launching an appeal there to get vital supplies to them. The Observer, Gove bids to end the refugee chaos with a £350 cash for rooms offer. And also a story there about the safe haven of uh, Lviv, which is in the far west of Ukraine, where they've heard si um, air raid sirens overnight, braces for the worst as the Russians close in. And the Sunday Express, £350. Again, that story on the front there. Thank you for giving refuge. And the mail on Sunday, uh, this is Michael Gove again, who uh, apparently is planning to seize oligarch mansions to house refugees. We'll be talking about that to him later on. And The Sun on Sunday, a very different story. Um, star who works with Anton Deck, hospital, his hospital treatment. Well, I'm joined to review all these papers with uh, Alison Phillips from The Mirror and Lucy Fisher from The Telegraph. Good morning to both of you. Um, Alison, let's start with you and the Sunday Mirror's story there, this, the siege of the cities. Yes, um, 
I think we're seeing now that the troops are moving closer to Kyiv and the story is told here and it's a bit out of sort of the Russian playbook really of surrounding the big cities. We've seen it for the last couple of weeks over around Mariupol um, and now they're getting closer now sort of thought to be about 15 miles outside of Kyiv. Um, artillery is moving in. There's a general sense that um, the next couple of days are going to be absolutely crucial. But then of course we had President Zelensky saying yesterday you will have to raise this city to the ground if you want to succeed. So but the, and the and there's so many defences are going in there that they they know that now this is the sort of the fight to the end. Mm, absolutely. I mean, that is the big question. What will happen to Kiev? It is it is still protected. It's got this huge ring around it. But what is President Putin planning to do? Well, you're right. We've seen sort of uh, uh, scenes that almost uh, mirror a World War One film set of trenches being dug, of people really bedding in. But I was really struck by one of the stories coming out of another um, town, which is um, Melitopol, um, where the mayor, uh, Ivan Fedorov, was taken captive um, by the Russians on Friday. Grainy CCTV footage showed him being led out with a bag on his mm. head, his arms pinned to his sides. Very brave yesterday, hundreds of Ukrainians took to the streets to chant, free our mayor, they want to see him out. But I think something this speaks to is the idea that while Russia um, has scant regard for law in terms of the law of armed conflict, inter international humanitarian law, Russia is now looking to a sham judicial process. It's talking about bringing um, charges against this mayor for terrorism in his town and, and trying to use that to somehow legitimise what they're doing mm. in these local regions. And you have been looking at a story that's on the front page of the Sunday Times as well. And this is about the, the city that is... Yes, well, so the governor says has just been destroyed. It's about the size of Truro. It is. Place, so it's, it? a, it's a relatively small, uh, it's a relatively small city in Volnikava um, that, that essentially has no longer exists. It's all been taken out, and so it's come to brutal bombardment um, for several days. And you've had people living there without food, without water. There's been stories about the people that have remained having to sort of drain heating pipes to get water. Um, and it, it, and this, I think, we've seen it before in Syria. Um, this, this again, this is how the, the Russian army will operate. They will just destroy, for, for, to destroy, but also to destroy morale, because people in Kiev are seeing these scenes and they're thinking, "Is this is what awaits us?" And it's unimaginable what people who are in these cities must be going through, because it's very, very, very difficult to get any information out of places like Mariupol, for example. Yes, but then interestingly as well, that what we have seen is the resolve of the Ukrainian people in that it would certainly appear that the morale isn't fading. And, and as we saw there in Melitopol earlier, you've got ordinary citizens taking mm. to the streets to say, no, this is not acceptable. Unarmed citizens going out there. And that is the big, you know, that leads to the big question, doesn't it? That people are starting to ask because people expected President Putin to go in there and, and just walk into Ukraine, take it in two or three days. That hasn't happened. So now you get these, these whispers. Could, could the Ukrainians actually win this? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And there's a fascinating um, analysis in the Sunday Times today from um, Mark Galliotti, um, a Russia expert. Um, as you say, he points out the initial assumption was that Russia's massive overmatch in terms of firepower would see the Kremlin storm the country in a matter of days. But Ukraine's a country the size of France. We've seen amazing resistance there. And um, Mark Galliotti goes through the figures so far. Um, the Russians have lost 5% of their vehicles and weapons deployed. Even the modest estimates of the number of Russian troops killed stands at about 5,000. Um, that means, given the usual ratio of dead to wounded, they've lost about 25,000 of their troops. And he really points out the importance of both momentum, which appears to have st stalled, and morale, which has plunged with Russian soldiers surrendering and deserting. The Ukrainians have obviously made much of that in their own sort of um, narrative war. Um, so look, I think the odds are still very tough for the Ukrainians and this piece doesn't gloss over that. But um, they've, they've done a lot better than expected. They're 18 days into this now. And there is some sense uh, of the Russian um, operation stalling. But on the other side, if President Putin does win this, there are these questions which are, you know, would have been unimaginable just even a few weeks ago. The piece there, I think it's the Sunday Telegraph, isn't it? You know, where does Vladimir Putin stop? If he, if he does take Ukraine, does he start rolling into other nations around there? Well, that is a big question. I mean, it seems unthinkable, uh, as you say. Um, there's an interview with Vladimir Grossman, the former Ukrainian prime minister today. He warns that if NATO doesn't sweep in now um, to help, it will be Poland, it will be Lithuania, it will be Estonia next. On the one hand, 
there's a reason, there's a rationale for Ukraine to try and um, get NATO more on board. They've pled for uh, a no-fly zone over their country, which NATO leaders have rejected. On the other hand, I think that there are growing concerns that Russia could um, resort to using biological or chemical weapons, tactical nukes. That might be a game changer for NATO. I was also struck yesterday that the Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia warned that um, the Kremlin views NATO um, arms convoys as being legitimate targets. So left menacingly unclear whether they would attack them within NATO or only once they cross the border into Ukraine. Mm. But of course, that could also see the alliance dragged into the war. Alison, let's talk about the, the scheme that the government is launching tomorrow. We'll talk to Michael Gove about it later in the programme, but uh, allowing many more refugees to come into Britain. £350 a month people are being offered to take them in. Yes, so I think, um, so the idea is that there'll be a, a, a scheme that people can sign up from as, as soon as tomorrow to express an interest, that they'll be interested in taking uh, refugees uh, into their homes, into a spare room, or if they've got a spare, um, a, a spare house. Um, uh, and then I think it's a one-off £350, which, which you would then get. But it's a minimum commitment of six months. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a significant commitment for people. But I... I I believe probably this time tomorrow we'll be doing stories about how the website has crashed by the number of people because there's a real sense in this country that we that we really that people ordinary people really want to help and I think there's been a real uh, disappointment that the government has been slow in dealing with um, the issue of refugees compared with um, other countries. I mean, I, yes, Poland's on the border, but when you look at the number of refugees Poland has taken, other countries More taken, than Ireland million, has taken. Absolutely. We have really, really, and, and still there is this issue around visas um, and that really are we asking people to go through these hoops. There was the shambles last week where we had people turning up in Calais then to be told you've got to go back to, to Paris mm. and Brussels. So we've really, really done quite poorly on this. And I think there's a line around today that apparently Boris Johnson's crossed with Priti Patel because he feels that she hasn't really dealt with it effectively. Um, and so now um, Michael Gove has stepped in to the fray and with, with his plan for um, sponsoring refugees which again I think it, it's not it's, it's not there's, there's a lot of detail still to be to be done. how do you find a refugee that you might wish to sponsor do you just have to sort of look at Facebook and then see if there's a family that so that's not clear mm. but it, it, it seems to be a good step in the right direction uh, Lucy let's talk about the uh, there's a big piece in the Sunday Times again this week this is about uh, Evgeny Lebedev yeah, a fascinating long read here about the son of a KGB spy turned oligarch billionaire. Um, Evgeny Lebedev has over many years ingratiated himself uh, into the heart of the British establishment. A fascinating timeline. It's extraordinary, this timeline about when he first met Boris Johnson and, and right up to 2020 when he got his peerage. Absolutely. It encompasses meetings in City Hall, um, the Boris Johnson attending summer parties, being hosted by Lebedev in Italy, correspondence, so very tight links. And after the Sunday Times revealed last week um, that the intelligence services had warned uh, that there was security risks to giving Lebedev a peerage back in March 2020, they revealed today that as long ago as 2013, um, Sir John Sawyers, then C, the head of MI6, um, put a block on a plan for um, Evgeny Lebedev to try and come to lunch at um, MI6's uh, headquarters in Vauxhall with Chris Blackhurst, the editor of the independent newspaper which he owned. So an extraordinary uh, tale of intrigue. Alison, let's talk um, about the cost of living, which is uh, covered as well in quite a lot of the papers because we've got this, this mini budget coming up in, what, 10 days time. Yes. Um, and, you know, this crisis, this war in Ukraine is going to affect everyone around the world, including us and prices are going to rise. Absolutely. I mean, I think we have to remember we were already in a cost of living crisis before the war began. Um, and and we, we need to sort of remember that people were already struggling. So this is just an additional. Um, how much support there's going to be in that spring statement remains to be seen. So, it, so the Sun has aligned that Rishi Sunak has ruled out any big bazooka action, which I think that people were hoping that there might be, that, there more, that more might be done to maybe reverse the idea about a national insurance hike. There might be more support for people on uh, universal credit so 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 the sun's saying no big bazooka but then meanwhile in the telegraph there is a line and i think it's sort of referring back to rishi sunak when he did so much around furlough where it says you know rishi should be judged by his previous actions and that people can trust him so 
Um, clearly, there, there, there is that sort of tension there as to how much we are going to mm -hmm. see and whether there's going to be support for families who, I mean, people are getting their energy bills in now, 700, 800 pounds more than they've been previously paying. And that's now. And then and we be... haven't even seen the start. We no. have, this is just the start. And then I the mean... October autumn bills, these are going to be horrendous. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we've got the price of food as well. So haulage companies struggling, so millions of pounds additional. And that's all going to go back, passed on to the consumer. Well, we will have to leave it there. But Alison Phillips and Lucy Fisher, thank you so much for joining me this morning. I'm joined now by Nick Miller, who's going to tell us what we have in store with the weather. Hello, Nick. Good morning. Low pressure close by. Blustery day today. We've had rain moving in overnight. That clears eastern areas this morning. We're left with sunshine and showers. And if you're closest to this area of low pressure, and that's through Irish Sea coast, Northern Ireland and western parts of Scotland, this is where the winds are strongest today, with gales in places. Here's the overnight rain still around eastern areas this morning. That pulls away, though, may linger through parts of East Anglia and the far southeast of England, even into this afternoon, whereas elsewhere it is sunshine, showers, heavy and possibly thundery, and quite wet at the moment in Northern Ireland, though drier and a bit brighter later in the day. A gusty day wherever you are, but around Irish Sea coast, the east of Northern Ireland, southwest Scotland, may be disruptive gusts of 50 to 60 miles an hour, and top temperature around 13 degrees Celsius in Northern England. Most places turn drier tonight, though we see another area of rain heading into Northern Ireland, where the winds are easing through Wales and parts of England. This is where temperatures will drop to their lowest overnight. So maybe a touch of frost here and there as we start the day tomorrow. For Monday, Tuesday, for Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern England, there'll still be some areas of rain around. All of that moves south on Wednesday. And then later in the week, we've got high pressure moving in. Drier, calmer conditions, chilly nights, yes, but fine, pleasant days going into next weekend. Sophie. Nick, thank you very much. More than two million people have already fled Ukraine. Many more are expected to follow. Most of those who've left have crossed into Poland and headed by train and bus to the capital, Warsaw, around 150 miles away. The mayor of Warsaw says around a quarter of a million Ukrainians are now in his city. Its population has swelled by more than 10% in just a fortnight. People have thrown open their homes to help, but now Warsaw is running out of space. This is the largest reception hub for Ukrainian refugees in Europe. The Expo Centre on the outskirts of Warsaw has been hastily transformed into a temporary home for those dispossessed by war. They were supposed to be hosting a gift fair here in this trade hall today. Instead, there are 7,000 refugees who have just arrived here in Warsaw. They stay for one or two nights before being taken by bus to other cities in Poland or elsewhere in the EU. And another life, who knows what. And the thing that really strikes you being here is, is just how quiet it is. It's just women and children, virtually no men. People here look stunned. The only noise you really hear is from children in the makeshift playroom and from the dogs and cats, pets too precious to leave behind. Olena Ponomarenko is a photo editor. She fled the besieged city of Chernihiv, north of Kyiv, with her cat and a friend. Her family are still there. They don't have uh, electricity, don't have water don't have uh, gas uh, and uh, warm. It's nothing. But they are alive. Olena has no idea what she's going to do now, but she needs money. Poland is full now, and we want to get refugee status and uh, find work by uh, official way. And what kind of work do you want to do? Really, I don't care. I want to earn money. I don't care why. I want. I, I. I will do anything. The man who owns the expo center cannot believe what is unfolding in his exhibition halls. Thousands pass through here every day. They're registered and given a blanket and food. Much of it funded by him, private companies, and manned by volunteers. My appeal to the United Kingdom citizens. Uh, please be solidarity with us. Be solidarity with those people, with those refugees. And please, if you have any possibility, to bring them under your roof to your houses, that would be the greatest thing and the greatest hope 
for them. Ukraine's President Zelensky addresses Poland's leaders from Kyiv, a glimpse of home for these women and children who arrived four days ago. In Warsaw, everyone knows someone who has taken in refugees. The former mayor of the city has given his family home for free, indefinitely. Everyone you meet is doing something to help. At the one night there was 17 refugees sleeping there, four of them left for Italy. And so right now we have uh, 13, uh, but still there is uh, some one or two rooms available for, for extra refugees if they come. How can you keep, not just you, but people in Poland are being very generous. How long can you afford to do that? Because it costs money, It doesn't it? It costs money. You know, in, in this case we just don't, 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 er, don't earn money, you know, uh, because we, we wanted uh, this uh, house to, to rent it out, you know, uh, but uh, for some extra uh, money, but, but we still have uh, enough resources to live on, you know, so of course we will not increase our savings, we will not increase our investment in, in our children. I have four children, 12 grandchildren, uh, but uh, this was a decision of all the family. Tamara Kovalenko is an associate professor at Kyiv University. She left her son, a doctor, behind and fled here with her daughter-in-law, who's a GP, and her children. <sighs> with the help of an interpreter, she tells me they spent six days in a cellar before escaping. It's difficult to talk about my um, grandchildren because... Uh, so the, um, one of them is uh, four years old, the boy, and for all the trip here he was very sad and he, he didn't understand what's happening with him. We want to go home, uh, we want to return uh, to our life, to our, uh, to our work, uh, we don't want to stay in another country. Mara Kovalenko there, just one of many, many refugees who simply want to go home. Well, I've been speaking to Poland's president, Andrzej Duda, about the refugee crisis in his country. But first I asked him if he thought the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, could, as is feared, be preparing to use chemical weapons in Ukraine. This is something the world has not seen on this scale since the Second World War. And if you're asking me whether Putin can use chemical weapons, I think that Putin can use anything right now, especially that he's in a very difficult situation. This is what most experts have been saying. Actually, politically, he has already lost this war. And militarily, he's not winning it. Although one could say there is a gigantic advantage of the Russian army over the Ukrainian army, if you take a piece of paper and if you do the maths, then they've got a crushing, overwhelming majority, but they are not able to win the war. If President Putin did use chemical weapons, is that a red line for NATO? Is that a point at which NATO then has to get involved? Well, of course, everybody hopes that he will not dare do that, that he will not use weapons of mass destruction, neither chemical weapons, nor biological weapons, or, nor any form of nuclear weapons. Everybody is hoping that this is not going to happen. But as we say in Poland, using a little bit of an English expression, if he uses any weapons of mass destruction, then this will be a game changer in the whole thing. And for sure, the North Atlantic Alliance and its leaders, led by the United States, will have to sit at the table and they will really have to think seriously what to do. Because then it starts to be dangerous, not only for Europe, not only for our part of Europe or our region, for Central Europe, but for the whole world. You have got 28 jets, MiG jets, Soviet-era jets, that Ukraine, you want to give to Ukraine. Their pilots could fly them. What difference would it make to people in Ukraine, do you think, if they had those planes? The issue of the jets which you have mentioned, of MiG-29s, which are at the disposal of the Polish armed forces, this is of course a very serious one, a very sensitive issue. There were various voices as to whether we should transfer or not transfer the jets. Speaking frankly, Polish public opinion was very much afraid of this step because the Russian side made a very clear announcement that it would consider it a war declaration 
and myself, looking from a perspective which I mentioned a moment ago uh, as of our responsibility within NATO, always remember that these are powerful airplanes. President Zelensky says this is about human lives. He says that he has asked once, he's asked again. He says we have to solve it faster and don't shift the responsibility. Send the planes to Ukraine. Why don't you just give them those planes now? When you say you, I hope you mean the North Atlantic community, in other words, NATO as a whole, because, as I said, due to Allied responsibility, Poland as such is not going to transfer those planes on the basis of our own decision, because we believe that Allies could bear a grudge against us, at least if we make this decision, because, potentially, it could place the entire NATO in a difficult position in its relationship with Russia. But it is a very serious decision. Please bear in mind that President Vladimir Zelensky and the Ukrainian authorities are in an extremely difficult situation. Of course, to me, it is obvious that they can have different demands and that they can have different expectations. Perhaps they can even air their grievances and all that is justified. I want to say this right away. It is justified because they are fighting. They are fighting for freedom. They are fighting for survival. However, transferring planes or President Zelensky demanding to establish a cupola or a shield defending the skies over Ukraine, so blocking the skies over Ukraine against the possibility of entering Ukraine airspace by Russian aircraft, combat aircraft, bombers or fighter jets. Well, this is a decision which is a strictly military one and a very serious one because it means that NATO jets would have to be sent to Ukrainian airspace and probably there would be a confrontation between NATO aircraft and Russian aircraft. And that would mean an opening, possibly, of the Third World War. So these are very serious decisions indeed. And are you very confident, are you fully confident that if Russia did attack Poland, that NATO would back you, that NATO would defend you? Madam, that's why we are members of the North Atlantic Alliance and we are trying to be as credible a member as possible. Because there are, there are people in Poland, aren't there, who, are, who fear that President Putin won't stop at Ukraine, that President Putin could attack elsewhere, that they could attack Poland, and they are worried about whether NATO will defend them. Do you think there's any truth in their, their fears? Pani redaktor. Madam, in 2008, Russia attacked Georgia, and back then the President of the Republic of Poland was Professor Lech Kaczynski, and I was a minister in his chancellery here at the Presidential Palace. I served with him. President Kaczynski decided to take pressure off Central Europe on board of his plane and fly to Tbilisi, which was under threat, and there in Tbilisi he said the prophetic words. He said, today is Georgia, tomorrow it might be Ukraine, then the Baltic states, and after that, a time may come for my country, for Poland. And he said that Russia had to be stopped because it had revived its imperial ambitions, which are dangerous. They are a dreadful danger to our part of Europe, and we do not want to be in the Russian sphere of influence. We were in that sphere of influence, we dragged ourselves out of it, and we never want to go back there again. Russia deprived us of our liberty many times. Russia murdered our citizens. Russia murdered us in captivity during the Second War. They murdered our officers and tried to eradicate the Polish intelligentsia here because they were a big part of the Polish intelligentsia. We know that Russia presents a deadly danger, irrespective if it is the Russia of the Tsars who partitioned Poland. There were three uprisings against the Tsarist Russia. Polish people shed blood. I was born in the Soviet sphere of influence in a state which was not fully sovereign, which was not fully free, and when somebody talks to me about Russian communism and socialism, shivers go down my spine. Never again and never again do we want to have Soviet soldiers here, and never again do we want to have the Soviet sphere of influence here. This is contradictory to all our cultural norms, and this is just destroying us as a nation. This is a destruction of our traditions. These are attempts at distorting our history. Nobody from the West, nobody who was not captured by the Soviets can realize what it means. You 
You have spoken to the president of Ukraine. You do speak to the president of Ukraine, President Zelensky. How much do you talk to him at the moment? Speaking frankly, I feel responsible as one who talked to him, but Vladimir told me when we said goodbye to each other, Andrzej, I do not know whether we will ever meet again. We knew, both of us, that an attack would happen at any minute, and as a matter of fact, I call Vladimir every day. He calls me at different tragic moments, such as when the serious bombardment of Kiev started, he called me that night. Vladimir assures me that the morale of Ukrainian armed forces with a big number of volunteers, there are many volunteers, their morale is very strong. Those people have a sense that they're defending their homeland, their houses, that they were attacked in a very treacherous and abhorrent way. One thing you are doing for his citizens is accepting them here, and you are getting refugees in vast numbers, one and a half million in Poland alone already. Uh, you're a nation of just 38 million people. That is a huge increase in your population. And presumably there will be many more in the days and weeks to come. Why did you choose to just open your borders? I am really deeply grateful to my compatriots because what they have shown so far, I'm speaking about ordinary people, they come to the borders with transport saying, I'll take four people, I will take a whole family to my home. Just imagine that 1.5 million refugees have crossed the Polish border and we have not built even a single refugee camp because all of them have been accepted in private houses, in hotels, in guest houses, in motels, in resorts. How, how many more do you think it could be? How many more refugees do you think could come here? I do not know. It's hard to assess. According to experts, in an extreme situation, it could be up to five million people. Of course, we are not the only country who is receiving them, because Romania, which shares a border with Ukraine, is also getting refugees. Hungary has a border with Ukraine. More than half of all refugees who have left Ukraine are in Poland. So if there are 5 million, then just imagine that we will get 2.5 million. It is hard for me to imagine. So we need support here on the ground. We need kind help, financial assistance, and we need to know how to manage the refugee crisis because there are certain procedures in place. For the UN, for instance, this is not the first crisis. It is the biggest crisis since the Second World War, definitely. So that's number one. Number two, I would request that the borders are opened and refugees are accepted. From what we, the people we have spoken to about who are helping the refugees, and they are here in huge numbers at the moment, are you as a government doing enough to help your people, support them? Because a lot of people, are, they say they're paying for the food, they're paying for the medicine themselves. They need the government support. At this moment, we are working out the mechanisms to resolve this issue, to help those who have shown generosity and given over their hotels and rest homes to refugees and are supporting these people with their own money. There is no doubt that we as a state must compensate these people and then take on the burden of upkeep of the refugees ourselves. President Duda. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much. Well, Ireland lifted restrictions on Ukrainians arriving in the country shortly after the invasion began, allowing them to arrive without visas or checks beforehand. Ireland's Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, Michal Martin, is in London, where he's been meeting with Boris Johnson to discuss the war in Ukraine, and he joins me now. Good morning. Good morning. Should every country just open its borders to Ukraine's refugees? Uh, that would be our view within the European Union. Um, and I think there are different ways that countries can assist here because we're all democracies uh, united together. And unity is the key issue here for us and key objective that between the U European Union, United Kingdom, United States, Canada, uh, and other like-minded democracies that we, we combine uh, unity of purpose in terms of sanctions and in terms of measures and doing everything we can to help and support the people of Ukraine who are really under a terrible bombardment uh, in a brutal and immoral war being waged upon them by Vladimir Putin. 
The security services here have reportedly warned the Home Secretary not to water down security checks. You in Ireland have welcomed already something like 2,500 Ukrainians so far. Have you conducted security checks on them? We've had about 5,500 5, yeah, in, 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 into Ireland um, at this stage. Uh, no, we're, 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 you know, we will have, we, we will monitor and so on. But no, our, our, our primary impulse is to assist those fleeing war. Um, and, um, and that's, you know, the, the Irish people are very seized by this the, the, the series of atrocities that are going on. What we're witnessing on our screens every evening is really shocking people and there's huge human empathy there, obviously, uh, to help the women and the children. And so we, we, because of the temporary protective directive of the European Union, what Ireland is doing, basically, if Ukrainians come into Ireland, they'll have access to our social protection uh, income. Uh, access to our health services, access to education, uh, the right to work immediately. Um, and and uh, we believe that's the correct thing to do in the context of the worst displacement of people and refugee crisis since World War II. Um, and, um, you know, that, and speed is important in a situation like this. Um, and there's always a balancing of issues, but we are in, you know, we, we keep the channels open with our UK counterparts and Home Secretary and um, our Minister for Justice, Helen McEntee, have been in regular contact. I, I met with the Prime Minister yesterday. He was, to be fair, the Prime Minister paid tribute to, to what Ireland was doing on the humanitarian front. But security concerns are something that's been talked about a lot here. So I'm just interested in whether, you know, do you have security concerns? Have your security services told you that you should be doing checks? Have you done any checks at all? In terms of individuals coming in, or it's the humanitarian response trumps anything as far as we're concerned. That's it. You know, so no security but, checks but the, at but, all? But our security people obviously will keep a monitoring situation in terms of what's going on, and people are being received at the airports, for example, uh, mainly to try and respond to them, get some details, but also to say to them, look, uh, here's how we can, here's, is how we can help you um, in terms of settling down. Now, it, it was interesting in the first wave of, if I use that phrase, or, or, um, about two thirds of those who came in in the first number of days had connections in Ireland already in terms of Ukrainian families living in Ireland and a third not. The, those who have no connections are now increasing because obviously of the ferocity of the war and the huge anxiety out there. But we can all see the humanitarian crisis. We do know that that can be exploited by certain uh, bad actors, uh, but we will use our, our, surveil our, our security personnel will keep an eye on that, obviously, in a more general way. Because the Home Secretary, as you said, um, spoke to the Irish, your, your Justice Minister. Did she actually ask you to toughen up rules? Uh, I, I, um, I wasn't privy to the, the, the precise um, uh, communication. Uh, I think we, ha we do share a common travel area and we respect that and that's, that's an important consideration. So we always maintain contact on issues like this. Um, but to be fair, I, uh, the Prime Minister, yes, the, his only impulse, uh, his only discussion with me was on the basis of um, really praising the Irish uh, humanitarian response uh, and no more than that. And uh, we didn't get into the security issues as such. You have already taken, as you say, five and a half thousand refugees. Your government has said it could take in more than a hundred thousand. How are you actually going to pay for that? How much is it going to cost? Because they need schools, they need hospital treatment, mm. medical treatment, welfare pay payments. It will logistically be very, very challenging. Uh, this is something Ireland has never experienced on this scale uh, before. Uh, but we believe we need to do it uh, because we believe this is a battle between democracy and authoritarianism fundamentally. We all share the same values, principles of freedom of speech, free media, uh, free trade, the capacity to enjoy life in, in a good quality with independence of thought and so on. So that's why we are engaged in, in this. But on the humanitarian side, uh, we believe it's important to do the, the right thing. It will be very, very challenging, not least in the, on the accommodation front. On the financial front, uh, again, it will stretch, but we did have contingencies in place for COVID-19 in terms of our budgetary frameworks, which I think we know some of that will have to be used to deal with this situation, the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. Um, and obviously it's a step-by-step -step approach, uh, but the, the sense from the European meeting Thursday and Friday uh, in Versailles was very much that this could be a longer, this could, is a long haul, um, and that um, you know, people who uh, see the situation as very grim indeed in terms of uh, that, that how, how long this war could go on. Uh, Ireland has <coughs> been neutral in military terms since the 1930s. You're not a member of NATO. Um, it does mean that you are helping to provide stuff to Ukraine, but it is non-lethal equipment. It is things like helmets. At a time when we see maternity hospitals being bombed, cities almost being razed to the ground, does that not feel immoral? 
Well, we're not politically neutral and we're not morally um, neutral. Uh, and but militarily... Yeah, but our military neutrality is apparently the EU has not hindered or held back anything in it, terms of, you know, the European Union response. But it has meant that you're not providing what yes. President Zelensky is calling for over and over again, which yeah. is arms and weapons. Well, it does mean that in terms of the 500 million deployment of, of funds to, to Ukraine, 450 million of which is lethal. Now, we're not part of that. We're part of the 50 million that's non-lethal. Uh, but it, it, we've paid our full per capita share uh, as a member state of the European Union towards that. Now, military neutrality, we are military neutral insofar as we're not part of NATO. Uh, my view right now is our focus is, and, and the people are united on this, is to make sure that there's a speedy response from the European Union to all of the issues that, 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 that require such a speedy response. We will have to reflect on this military neutrality position uh, more generally, uh, and there, you know, we've had a strong nuclear non-proliferation stance, and so on. But in, in the got middle time of time to reflect but, more well, generally, no, I because, mean, is, but, this is what they need now, isn't well, it? Well, they uh, need the arms. Yeah, but they anything where yeah, we're not a military power. We're not, a, you, you know, in, in that sense. Uh, what Ireland does best is on the humanitarian side and on the peacekeeping side. We, we've been one of the longest states involved in peacekeeping all over the world. That those are our strengths. Uh, we're not, the European Union, we've evolved our security and defence policy within the European context and the European uh, Common Security and Defence Framework. Uh, so we're, mem we're partners for peace with NATO, we're uh, members um, of PESCO and so on like that. So we do into joint things. But the bottom line now, we need to keep a unified focus within Ireland on the Ukrainian situation and what we do best. The, 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 you, one cannot, in the middle of a crisis, change a long-held policy but overnight. But do, do you think this crisis <coughs> may affect that in the long term, well, because it is redrawing the lines around the globe, isn't it? Correct. I mean, I think the, in, in, correct in the sense that it is redrawing, the, the, I mean, the multilateral rules-based order has been torn upside down by uh, President Putin. We have to reflect on that as a country. We have to reflect on the cyber security threat. It's not just conventional warfare, it's the cyber security, it's hybrid warfare. And that has implications for the European Union, it has implications for Ireland in terms of our vulnerability. Um, so when we had a major cyber attack on our health service last year in the middle of COVID, and it was a very severe attack, you know, the UK were very helpful to us, Poland was helpful to us um, in respect of uh, you know, support they had been through similar cyber security at attacks as well. So I, I believe we should reflect on it uh, without drawing down hard and fast conclusions right now. There will be a debate in Ireland about that. We don't have time for it right now. So we have to concentrate on speedy responses, making sure that nothing holds back the European Union in terms of the nature of its response to this. And Europe will, as a union, will be reflecting on this also. And what about <coughs> the Northern Ireland Protocol? Liz Trust, the EU still negotiating over the Northern Ireland po Protocol. That's obviously the arrangement that governs the relationship between Northern Ireland, Great Britain and the EU after Brexit. Does this war in Ukraine also mean that this issue is going to be kicked into the long grass for the foreseeable future? I think future? what it means, and what's interesting, and I, I welcome this warmly, is a very strong partnership between the UK, EU, US on, 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 on the fundamental issues of substance which is, as I said earlier, democracy, human rights, the freedom of the individual. Uh, and that is something that I think really trumps the big the, the issues. And it really says to us all, look, we should be able to resolve issues to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and it, to me, uh, and I, you know, I've talked to people in Northern Ireland, businesses and in industry, access to the single market is important to Northern Ireland in terms of inward investment and in terms of economic development more generally, as of course is access to, obviously to the UK market. We should be able to resolve this. Maris Sefcovic, I think, has been a very responsive commissioner and he's you know, working um, with uh, Liz Truss and the, and the UK side. I think there, there are elections coming in, in May in Northern Ireland. In my view, we, we should keep the channels going in respect of the discussions that Will are anything underway. change before <coughs> the elections? I, I'm not of a view that they, they, they will, and or nor maybe should they. I think we should, you know, we should concentrate obviously on our response to the Ukraine, see can we make progress on the, in the talks, because progress has been made despite what you might hear. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, positions put forward by the European Union that would reduce the level of, 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 of uh, checks and so on on SPS, uh, on medicines and all of that. So I would say that, you know, Maris Sefcovic, the EU, EU have put forward a lot of sensible compromises and their mindset is to really work to resolve this. And I believe that the Foreign Secretary is in a similar uh, mode of thought. Michal Martin, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Now, last Sunday, I spoke to the Monty Python star, Michael Palin, about his travels through Ukraine. He first went there 30 years ago when it was still part of the USSR. On his train journey, he met a young Ukrainian nationalist called Vadim Kostelli. 
I see Ukrainian history being revived. I see Ukrainian culture, you know, the, the culture which many people thought is, you know, is gone forever. Well, 15 years later, Ukraine was independent and Michael Palin returned and met up with Vadim once again in Independence Square. When we next meet, if we're both still alive in 15 years' time, what do you think you'll be saying about, uh, about the world then and about Ukraine? Ukraine, uh, by that time, uh, should be uh, much more sovereign, much more independent, well, of course, much more prosperous, hopefully a part, uh, a real part of the European uh, family. Well, that was 15 years ago, and that was the last time that they met. They lost touch. But after Michael and I spoke last Sunday, I began looking for Vadim, and I found him in a house just south of Kyiv, wondering how long he and his family would be safe. A few days ago, we managed to reunite Michael and Vadim. I feel very emotional. I really do feel very emotional. Mm. There he is. Hi, Vadim. Vadim. It's, it's, it's good to see you again, um, and I'm just so, so sorry about the dreadful circumstances. And my, my heart goes out to you and your family and everyone um, around you in Ukraine. Um, so uh, I'm glad you're safe. Are you safe? Michael, thank you very much. You know, it's, I'm happy to see you here. I wish we were Me talking too. in a different situation and not in this terrible and tragic days that my country is facing i am relatively safe because uh, my family and i were staying in our house which is in the outskirts of kiev which is probably in the only place that putin has not bombed yet you know when we talked we had that i looked at the other day that lovely talk we had in in uh, independence square and the sun was shining and the flags were up there and um you were celebrating democracy and you said well if and when we meet in 15 years, what will have happened? And you said you hope that um, you, Ukraine would be um, a sovereign nation and that there would be, you'll be part of the European family. And I was just wondering whether, were you so, so successful in this that Putin invaded? Do you think that's the reason why? Right. You know, I think that the real reason why Putin has invaded us is to put an end to this mm nationalist Ukraine, which is national Ukraine. We are all nationalists because we all want to be a nation that is not part of Russia, which is why he hates us, you know. And uh, now when he made his troops, his murderers, his killers enter Ukraine, mm. and uh, instead of being welcomed with flowers, which is what he was telling them, that of course, as soon as you come into Ukraine, you know, people will be happy to see you, you liberate yeah. them. Instead, they uh, welcome them with Molotov cocktails. Vadim, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay put or are you going to try and leave? We have organized. We have uh, a unit of territorial defense, as we call it. I have my yeah. old, you know, hunting rifle and uh, this is something that is almost next to me as i speak to you because mm -hmm. okay we don't have the russians coming in at the moment but you can never know when they can arrive so i'm going to stay put for now You're not such a young man but i still know so you will to, fight you, you will know, fight if you have to weapons i hope so mm. at least that i'm going to stay here it's, it's interesting i because neither of us are young men anymore have to, and I we will. met uh, for that first time on the train when your country was part of the soviet union then 15 years later, and this wonderful sort of feeling of democracy and openness um, in the Independence Square, and now this. But I have great hope. I, I do, I do, you know, I, I feel that what's happening and what the people are doing in Ukraine is, is so admirable that it has, to be, it has to be rewarded. I mean, you're clearly not going to give up. I mean, do you think that there's things that the outside world, the rest of the world sort of should be doing that they're not doing now? demanding that NATO would impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine is not realistic, and I understand it. Demanding that the West immediately stop buying Russian oil and gas is not realistic, and I understand that. So that's why I said what we can hope for now is just more weapons so that we can keep resisting. Yeah. Michael, can I ask you, um what it's like seeing Vadim now because you met him 30 years ago yeah. you met him mm. again mm. 15 years later you lost touch didn't you 
Yes, and until yeah. we spoke last week, you had no idea what had happened to him, and, and here he is now, yeah. in these terrible circumstances. Well, it, there are terrible circumstances, and I'm so glad to, to talk to you, actually, because, I mean, we, t we talked in good times, and it's great that we can talk again in bad times, because there has to be some sort of, you know, communication between us, between the nations, between the countries supporting Ukraine is so, so important. And I think that the, the worst thing that can happen is that the communications end and uh, the Russians block all our uh, ability to talk to you and your people. So I think just the fact of us meeting makes me feel a whole lot better, but very, 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 very upset for you and what you're going through. It is so important for me here and for, you know, so very mm. many people here to feel support coming from you. Yes. To feel this continuity, as you correctly said, of course, we need to still feel ourselves a part of the big Europe, a part of the bigger civilization. We feel like, you know, we are on the on the mm. side of the civilization, while the other side is the just complete darkness. It is very important for us to keep uh, feeling your uh, support. And Vadim, just describe what it is like for you at the moment, how aware you are of, of the, the war, how close it is to you. Can you hear it? Absolutely. Uh, the air raid sirens went off in Kiev about 45 minutes ago, and we can hear them. Blasts that are more or less distant, but some of them make the windows shake. This is what life is for, I'm afraid, most part of Ukraine today. And this is what people are trying to escape with those millions already of mostly women and children who are leaving for Poland, for, the, for Slovakia, for Hungary. And uh, so we are here relatively safe, but it's going to change. I mean, it cannot, unfortunately, remain like that. Although we will, we will keep resisting, we will keep fighting. Can I ask you, Vadim, um, I don't know, you were a young man in Michael's film when we first met you 30 years ago. I don't know how old you are now, but men in Ukraine have to, have to stay uh, if they're under 60. Could you leave Ukraine if you wanted to? Yes, I can. I'm uh, 64. And uh, uh, legally, uh, nothing can stop me, and I can uh, try to leave the country. It's not an easy way in uh, terms of logistics, but I can do that, and I can take my wife. I would not want to, at least not for now, uh, because I feel like, you know, I'll, the reason why Putin could not take over Ukraine uh, after two or three days, like everyone has predicted, was because nobody mm -hmm. uh, on the Russian side expected Ukrainians to, you know, to mm -hmm. resist with such heroism. And I just have to be a part of my, of my nation. Well, Vadim, it is wonderful that we found you. Michael and I spoke about you when we first yeah. talked about uh, Ukraine and mm -hmm. the film that you two made. And it is fantastic that we have actually found you. And I really hope you can stay safe and we wish you all the luck that you need to do so. Thank you so yeah. much, Sophia. Thank you so much, Michael. It was well, such a pleasure, you know, seeing you. And uh, have I told you you haven't changed since I saw you last? <laughs> well, I've got a bit older, so it says ah, on my, just, on just my birth bit. certificate. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I, I, it's great to see you. And, and I, I feel your sort of, I feel your strength there, which is, which is important. You're clearly not <laughs> defeated. You're not giving up. Um, despite the awful circumstances, and, and that's that's very inspiring. And I know we'll speak again. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Well, since we spoke to Vadim, he has actually decided to move his family to safety in Western Ukraine. They should have arrived just a few hours ago. Uh, I spoke to him last night, and he said his plan is to return to Kyiv, though, in the next few days. Well, let's go live to Ukraine now and find out what has been happening there overnight. I'm joined by the advisor to Ukraine's defense minister, Markian Lubkivsky. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you Thank tell you. us, first of all, what more can you tell us about the, the attack on the military base, which is very close to Poland's border? Thank you so much for having me here. And I'm really proud of the words said by my predecessor, uh, your previous guest. I appreciate that very much. So uh, one more terrible night, one more terrible attacks on Ukraine. 
So uh, today, uh, early morning, Russia has attacked the International Center for Peacekeeping and Security near Lviv. And this is very close. This is almost 15 kilometers from the border with the Poland. This is not military center. This is peacekeeping and security center. So, and this is only, as I mentioned, 15 kilometers to the border with the EU and with the NATO. Nobody can be safe. According to the chief of Lviv military administration, Mr. Maxim Kozitsky, nine people unfortunately killed and uh, 57 were wounded. It was terrible attack. So the geography of Putin's attack is becoming wider. Uh, this night, Russians attacked uh, Lutsk. So Lutsk airport is almost totally demolished. Lutsk uh, is the, the western part of Ukraine. So Russia uses phosphorus munitions, which are prohibited by international conventions. So uh, a lot of people, a lot of people suffering every day. A lot of refugees are trying to get to, to Poland, to the, to the western border. So one more very hot night for Ukraine. What do you think the Russian army has planned for the capital, Kyiv, which so far has been almost untouched? So I, I, uh, I, I has, I has my own experience based mostly on, on my, my uh, work in, in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina and in former Yugoslavia. So I, I think that the, uh, the strategy of Putin is to take into surrender uh, Kyiv and to make pressure on Ukrainian leadership. I need to stress that President Zelensky is staying in, in Kyiv. Uh, government is working there, as well as, as, a, as, a, as Ukrainian parliament. So the plan of Putin is to make from Ukrainian cities uh, numerous Aleppos. This is terrific. So situation is, is quite critical, but uh, Kyiv is still not surrounded. There is uh, the opportunity for, for corridors to bring uh, uh, different med medicines, to bring uh, uh, some other support to, to people who, who stay there. And uh, but uh, the intention of, of Russians is to to attack from the south because from the north they are very close to the Kyiv city center. It's around 25, 30 kilometers. So they, they want to take Kyiv, Kyiv into the circle. Do you think Russia is preparing to use chemical weapons? What is the latest intelligence that you have? Yes, we can we cannot exclude. Uh, there is a, a nuclear threat still, because uh, Putin and his his uh, his people are, are playing with that. So there were uh, there were some 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 info, there was some information regarding that that they can use. Now nobody nobody can be safe right now, and we don't know what we can expect from from Russians. I have uh, from the other side. So from the other side, excuse me if I can. From the other side, they are now providing uh, 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 with, the, with the information that like Ukrainians are pro producing this chemical weapon here on the territory of Ukraine, which is which is uh, absolutely lie. This is not truth. They want to use that information as a reason to attack Ukraine. I have uh, sitting with me listening to you now a minister from the British government. What, what is your message to him to, to the British government? Uh, first of all, we are very grateful to you, Mr. Minister. We are very grateful to your people. You helped us a lot already. Uh, my minister, Mr. Reznikov, is in touch with, the, with, the, with your minister. Uh, our intention, our will to close the sky over Ukraine. In case you cannot support us in that, please, first of all, be very strong with the sanctions. Go, go ahead with the sanctions. You made tremendous job. Sanctions are sanctions are working, but it's it's not. It, but they they should be much more wider and much more personified. Second thing, please protect other people, help other people who left uh, Ukraine. We're really looking forward to get your support in terms to give, to provide them with a with a temporary home. So this is very important. And and the the last but not the least, provide us with a means 
to protect ourselves. Due to Winston Churchill, please provide us with the tools and we will finish the job. Markian Lubvinsky, thank you so much for talking to us this morning. And uh, Michael Gove uh, is with me now. Your, your response? Well, uh, first of all, I am in awe of the bravery of the, of, of the people of the Ukraine. Um, and um, uh, what they are facing at the moment is, as we all know, one of the most uh, uh, horrendous atrocities, a series of war crimes being perpetrated uh, by a leader who is out of control. Um, and what we need to do is to demonstrate solidarity. And exactly as we've just heard, there are three things that uh, a government like ours can do and is doing. The first, sanctions. Um, we've moved fast, but there is more that we must do in order to sanction those who are responsible for supporting Putin. Secondly, support, humanitarian support for people on the ground. Um, and we can say more about that in a moment, I'm sure, Sophie. And then the third thing, again, is lethal aid. Um, uh, the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, was the first Western Defence Secretary to provide and to guarantee to Ukrainian armed forces uh, the material that they needed and the training they needed in order to repulse this Russian attack. We heard from uh, from uh, Mike and Ned that the obviously the, the Russians have bombed this centre. It's just seven miles from the Polish border. How much of an escalation do you think that is? Well, it's significant. We know that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, has no moral limits when it comes to the actions that he's prepared to take, and he's also pushing the boundaries in military terms as well. Um, we've already seen the um, abuse of humanitarian corridors. Um, the Russians say, on the one hand, we saw this last week, that they're going to allow people to leave, and then when people seek to leave, they are bombed and killed. We've seen maternity hospitals attacked. Now, um, as uh, forces move from the south, from the east and from the north, uh, he's attempting to tighten the vice. But we also know Ukrainian armed forces and Ukrainian civil society are standing strong and fighting back. There is an attempt, obviously, by Putin to try to break the will of the Ukrainian people. That will not happen. Um, and again, one of the things that we know, exactly as we've just heard, is that um, uh, Russia's already lost this war politically. Um, uh, and militarily, uh, there is no happy outcome for Russia. Earlier this week, we heard um, a, a Russian pilot who had been, um, whose plane had been down by Ukrainian um, uh, forces explain that he regarded himself as a war criminal for what he was doing. He appealed to other Russian soldiers not to carry on this conflict. Um, we know that there is still some way to go because of the, the grim vice that Putin has over his people and his armed forces. But we need to be strong and patient. Where are the red lines? I spoke to President Duda, Poland's president, who said chemical weapons are, would be a game changer. There are these attacks very close to the Polish border. At what point does the West intervene? Well, we're already doing everything that we can to support. Um, support and is very different, obviously, to yeah, intervening. Absolutely. But one of the things that um, we need to be conscious and careful of is that we're also dealing in, in, uh, uh, with Russia as a nuclear armed power. Nobody wants to uh, see this conflict escalate. That is why uh, uh, it's important for uh, the United Kingdom and its allies in the European Union and NATO to coordinate our response to demonstrate strength and solidarity. We've reinforced um, um, our uh, military deployment in Estonia and in Poland and elsewhere. We stand ready, but it's really, really important, given the scale and the nature of uh, what escalation would involve, that we all do everything we can to avoid the conflict escalating in that way. One thing uh, you're launching tomorrow to help the people who are having to flee this conflict is a scheme to allow people to take in Ukrainian refugees here. If somebody is watching right now and wants to take in a refugee, what do they need to do? Tomorrow we'll be launching um, a portal, a website, which will allow anyone who wants to help to register their interest. And then from Friday, um, we will have a, a, a process set up whereby we can match named individuals, um, uh, families from Ukraine, with individuals here. And I would hope that within a week, there'll be people who can benefit from that scheme. How do they find them, though? I mean, you're relying on people having to find the Ukrainian refugees in order to take them into their homes. It's not that easy, is it? It's the fastest way in which we can get people um, out of danger and into the United Kingdom. Um, and it is the case already that uh, uh, whether it's through uh, social media platforms or whether it's through charities and civil society, those connections are being made. We know that we have in this country, um, <clears throat> according to the most recent test of public opinion, 
uh, hundreds of thousands of people potentially who are willing to take uh, Ukrainians into their home. And we also know that there are uh, uh, faith groups, uh, whether those are churches, Jewish groups, humanitarian organizations and others that are brokering those links and making those connections. And that's the fastest way we know of providing people with support. It's a big commitment though, isn't it? Because it's, yes. it's minimum six months. I mean, would you take somebody in? Yes. Um, I'm exploring what I can do. I know that there are others who have. Um, again, uh, without going into my personal circumstances, there are a couple of things I'd, I'd need to sort out. But yes, however, it is a big commitment. Um, and that's why we're providing £350 uh, per month uh, for, uh, uh, for every you know, household that comes here. It's also the case that we're providing money to local authorities in order to pay for the public services that people will need while they're here. And of course, people when they're here will be able to work as well and to contribute to society. How many people have already been given visas, have been granted visas to come here? Under the existing family scheme, just over 3,000. 3,000, so that's an increase. It was only about just under 1,000, wasn't it, at the yes. end of last week? So 3,000, there are 22,000 applications. It's still pretty slow. Well, we're processing them rapidly, and indeed, uh, the Home Secretary has deployed additional resources, m more human beings, more technical capacity in order to ensure that we can process them. And of course, from Tuesday, the policy changes, so you no longer need to go to a visa application centre if you have a valid Ukrainian passport. You can uh, simply apply online, have your uh, application turned around relatively rapidly, then you will get notification. There'll be a PDF you can have on your phone or you can print out, and then you can come to this country. And the visa application centers themselves are now open uh, longer, more hours, more people being processed. You look at the numbers that we have accepted so far, 3,000, as you say, and that's two and a half weeks in. Mm. Poland, where I was, more than one and a half million, everybody opening their doors. Germany's got more than 100,000, Moldova, 82,000. Uh, Slovakia, more than 165,000. It has been far too slow here, hasn't it? Uh, no, I disagree. I, I think <clears throat> the countries that you mentioned, Poland, Slovakia, Romania, Moldova, um, uh, they're countries which are Ukraine's neighbours, as we all know. Therefore, uh, uh, it's only natural that um, as people are fleeing, it's those countries which are closest to Ukraine, which in the first few weeks will have the largest number of people. That's why we've been providing uh, humanitarian support there. We're the biggest bilateral provider of humanitarian support to those frontline states. And uh, the leaders of four of those frontline states were here talking to the Prime Minister this week, and they made it clear that at this stage, the most important thing is what we've done, to give them the money and the expertise to be able to deal with the massive influx of, uh, of humanity. And now we are in a position to be able to say, we're not just providing that support there, we're also willing to provide and ready to provide more homes for more people who are fleeing persecution. So you're happy with our response so far? 3,000 is fine in your books? Uh, I think we can always do better and that's why uh, and it's not too slow. You're, you're pretty happy with it. 3,000 is not very many compared to everybody else, and you're happy with that. I'm never happy with um, uh, any situation uh, where there is always more to be done, um, and neither is anyone else in government. We are all doing everything we can to move as quickly as possible, but I think it's important that we bear in mind... Uh, and, 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 you know, it's not, a, it's not a contest or a competition. It's about compassion um, and about support. And we provided support to the Ukraine in order to safeguard its sovereignty and integrity against this horrendous onslaught. We provided support to those countries that have the largest number of refugees at the moment. Now we're stepping up our humanitarian uh, uh, scheme with Homes for Ukraine. Um, and all of this together is a full spectrum response. And there's no cap, is there? So, no. I mean, uh, what are we looking at? We could a million? We could have a million refugees? Uh, I think that we'll get uh, the tens of thousands. Uh, again... The Prime Minister said hundreds of thousands. Well, it's an uncapped scheme. I think that's the figure. We've looked at different models. Uh, it depends on uh, resource, the generosity of um, uh, people across society and business. But certainly, even since... Uh, reports of the scheme have been launched. We've had lots of incredibly generous offers. As I say, tomorrow our website will go live to record um, uh, those individuals and organisations that want to help. Can I ask you about uh, Evgeny Leb Lebedev, um, yes. the owner of The Independent, the owner of The Evening Standard, his father, a KGB spy turned oligarch. You had dinner with him, didn't you, at Boris Johnson's house yes. uh, when you decided which side you were going to support in the Bre Brexit referendum. Did you know then that the security services were worried about him? No. You had no clue at all? No. How do you feel about that now? Well, uh, 
Mr. Lebedev, Lord Lebedev, um, is proprietor of the Evening Standard. He's someone who is a British citizen. Um, again, uh, there are reports in the newspapers today, but I know that uh, Lord Lebedev has, on the front page of his newspaper, condemned Putin's actions, and quite right too. Um, and uh, uh, again, I think there is a distinction to be drawn between the actions of parents and the actions of children. Do you think it's right, though, for the Prime Minister to have ignored concerns from the security services and to give a peerage to a Russian-born businessman who has links with Putin? I was not aware of any of the concerns that have been expressed until they appeared in newspapers. Um, again, um, I, I think it's important to draw a distinction between uh, uh, Evgeny Lebedev's father, um, uh, who obviously, as you pointed out, um, worked for the KGB, um, and uh, Lord Lebedev himself, uh, who is someone who has uh, made his home in this country. Of course, there are questions that are going to be asked, but um, no one has ever said to me that there are any specific security concerns that they have about Lord Lebedev. But uh, Keir Starmer was here last week and he said that there should be an inquiry into this and just to, to establish how this peerage was given. And there were concerns from the security services, we're told. And Keir Starmer says that should be looked into. Do you agree? Um, as far as I know, the process by which peer, peerages are appointed is one which is rigorous. There's a special committee that looks at the nominations that go forward. I'm sure that all the proper, pro, proper processes have been followed. If not, then uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, those involved will make that clear. You have said um, that you want to tighten sanctions. You have already put sanctions on oligarchs' houses. Are you really going to seize oligarchs' houses and house Ukrainian refugees in them. That's the front page of the, the mail this morning. Uh, I want to explore an option which would allow us to use the homes and properties of sanctioned individuals for as long as they are sanctioned um, for uh, humanitarian and other purposes. There's quite a high legal bar to cross um, um, and we're not talking about permanent confiscation but we are saying you're sanctioned, you're supporting Putin, this home is here, you have no right to use or profit from it, and more than that, while you are not using or profiting from it, if we can use it in order to help others, let's do that. But the way the sanctions work at the moment, they can use them. You can, if you have sanctioned a house of an oligarch, he can still live in it, he or she can still live in it, even though it's sanctioned, they just can't sell it. We want to make sure that we can go further, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to explore, as you say, a high legal bar, because in my view, uh, it is the case that uh, if your wealth and your influence is being deployed in order to support or to provide comfort to Putin, given what he's doing, then I'm afraid you have to bear the consequences. The sanctions process involves us going through a, uh, uh, a rigorous analysis of just who should be subject to the sanctions, We've moved as rapidly as we possibly can, but it seems to me that uh, if we can use those assets for as long as someone is sanctioned in an appropriate way, then we should. So you've been to dinner with Lebedev, uh, Roman Abramovich, a well-known figure in this country. How well do you know him? Have you been on his super yacht, for example? I've never met Roman Abramovich. You've never met him at all? No. No, you've not been on his yacht at all? No. I no think the, um, the biggest boat I've been on is the CalMac ferry from uh, Oban to Collinsy. OK, fair enough. Uh, the cost of living now is obviously going to be affected enormously by this. Uh, it's going to hit people right around the world. Are you doing enough for people? And will the government stick with the sanctions? Because they are going to have a huge impact on people's lives. Will you stick with those sanctions, however expensive, however much it costs people here? Yes, uh, and uh, we're very aware that um, there are cost of living pressures that will accumulate as a result of what's going on in uh, Ukraine. Uh, it is the case that Russia is a major oil and gas producer. We have to wean ourselves off in the West that uh, 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 production. Uh, uh, Britain is one of those countries that is less exposed to uh, supplies of Russian oil and gas, but the world is affected when a major producer like Russia faces the sanctions that are necessary. David Cameron said that the best way to help people through this cost of living crisis is to keep people's taxes down. Are you going to cut people's taxes? We've got a mini budget coming up. Uh, no, what we have to do at the moment is to provide support in every way possible that is targeted. We have cut taxes by cutting council tax for people uh, who are on the lower bands. Uh, we're doing that deliberately in order to target support at those on lower incomes at a time when we know that they face 
considerable pressures. But behind your question may be a suggestion that we should uh, do away with the national insurance increase. No, we're not doing that. We need that national insurance increase in order to make sure that we can fund the NHS and social care to deal with the COVID backlog. Could you suspend it, or not suspend it, could you postpone it for a year at least, just to give people some time to get used to what is going to be a huge change to their cost of living? I don't think we should do that, but I do think that we should keep under review all the measures that we have in order to provide support. We are providing um, uh, around £20 billion worth of support for people in, uh, 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 in facing cost of living pressures. And there is specific targeted support, a £9 billion package that the Chancellor announced specifically to deal um, with energy and other costs. Michael Gove, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Thank you. And thank you to all my guests this morning. I hope you can join us next weekend. Goodbye.